Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining Duke Science and Society for the latest installment of our coronavirus conversations. Um, my name is Tim McDermott. I am the event manager here at Duke Science and Society. Um, I'm coming to you from my lovely home studio. It is a beautiful sunny day here in North Carolina. We've had rain and rain and rain for the past week. So uh, finally getting to enjoy some of that. So just a few um, housekeeping notes before we had in, handed over to the moderator. Uh, the chat is open to, and we are taking questions from the audience. You can either send them to myself, Timothy McDermott, or Ben Shepard, and we will pass those along to our, uh, our host. Uh, should we experience any technical difficulties during the event and lose connection of any kind, all you have to do is go back to your email, click on the link, and it will take you right back into the meeting, and we will start it up as soon as we're able. Uh, the last thing is make sure you head over to the Duke Science and Society website to check out our next coronavirus conversation, which is next week, May 28th. Uh, it is about the narratives we tell about disease and how those narratives affect our view of society and how the stories will impact our future responses to pain. So we've got a great panel for that one. Please uh, go over RSVP, tune in and join us. Um, and make sure while you're there, you learn about our masters where professors like Jory and others uh, deal with these questions, wrestle with these difficult issues every single day in class. Um, all right, so I'm gonna get out of the way. Our moderator today, as you can see, is uh, Dr. Jory Weintraub. He is the Science Communication Program Director and a Senior Lecturing Fellow with the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. Um, Jory, favorite part of the last dance? Um, all of the references to UNC basketball, go Tar Heels. Anyone who doesn't say their favorite part is Scottie Pippen, I don't trust. Or I'm sorry, Dennis Rodman, I don't trust. If Dennis Rodman wasn't your favorite part of that show, I don't know what to tell you. All right, Jory, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm sure our, uh, hopefully our panelists will turn on their video here in just a second. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we got one. One, two, three. There they are. Oh, we got all of them. There we go. All righty. I'm going to unmute everyone and then I'm going to hand. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, thanks to all our panelists for being part of this event. I'll introduce all of you in just a moment. And thanks to everybody who signed up and who is attending today. Um, we did get over 300 people signing up to attend this webinar. Um, many of you submitted questions. We are going to try to answer all 300 questions today in an hour. There's no way we're going to be able to do it, but we will try to get to audience questions. Um, um, as I was looking through some of the questions that were submitted in advance, a lot of them sort of cluster into a certain category. So I think we should actually be able to touch on a lot of your questions during the course of that hour. Really excited to have this um, panel today lined up to cover this topic. It's uh, obviously a hugely important topic. There are tens of thousands of graduate students working on PhDs in STEM disciplines in this country right now. Um, if you add in people working on master's degrees in STEM disciplines, the number has got to be in the hundreds of thousands. And every single one of them obviously has been affected by COVID, as have we all. Um, but it's some of the challenges and issues are unique for graduate students in STEM disciplines, whether they're working in a laboratory setting and doing bench research or, or trying to be doing bench research, or whether they're field scientists, field biologists out there collecting data in the field. Either way, um, they're encountering obstacles. They haven't been able to go into the lab. They haven't been able to go out and do field work. So it's a time of great challenge for right now as if graduate school wasn't stressful enough already. Um, so we've lined up a fantastic panel. We have um, someone, and I'll int introduce them all shortly, but we have someone who is coming from a lab science background, someone who's more of a field scientist, and then we have an assistant dean in the graduate school to bring that perspective in as well. So let me go ahead and introduce everybody really quickly, and then we'll jump right into the questions. So first, I'd like to introduce Alexandra Kralik. Um, Alexandra is a fourth-year PhD student and an NSF National Science Foundation GRFP fellow in biological anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. She studies sex differences in great apes and humans. Um, she's also active in science communication. She makes really cool TikTok videos on human evolution that you should definitely check out. Um, and she, she shares these through her Twitter feed, Hominid Evolution Fun Facts. Uh, and I'm, hopefully we can get, um, get the, all of the 
Twitter handles posted in the chat room for all of you. Um, and she has a BS in biological anthropology from George Washington University. And as I said, working on her PhD at University of Pennsylvania. Our next panelist is Susanna Harris. Susanna just received her PhD about a month ago, right, Susanna? Yeah, about, about that somehow. About, about a month ago from UNC Chapel Hill in um, microbiology, actually same university and department where I got my graduate degree, but much longer ago than that. She studies bacterial interactions and plant microbiomes. Um, I also have dubbed her one of the pandemic pioneers in that she was one of the first to actually go through the process of preparing for and delivering her dissertation defense entirely online over Zoom as a result of the pandemic. So she certainly will be able to talk about that experience as well. I um, also want to mention that while she was in graduate school, she established an organization called PhD Balance, which promotes and supports graduate student mental health and was also very active in science communication, science communication training, and uh, is a prolific tweeter as well. Um, finally, our third panelist, last but not least, is Dr. Melissa Bostrom, who's currently an assistant dean in the graduate school at Duke University. Um, her responsibilities there include overseeing graduate student professional development and serving as director of the Emerging Leaders Institute. Melissa received her MA and PhD from UNC Chapel Hill and has a bachelor's degree in psychology uh, and a degree in English from Denison University. So wonderful panel um, representing field science, lab research, and sort of the administrative graduate school uh, perspective. And we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the questions. So Alexandra, I'd like to start with you. Um, you're currently a fourth year grad student studying biological anthropology. And a lot of your research involves travel both to museums to work with specimens and also into the field to collect field data. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you would be doing right now were it not for COVID-19 and how this has all interrupted your normal routine and how you've tried to keep your research moving um, during this time of sort of upheaval? So I would normally have been right now um, CT scanning uh, orangutan bones from nearby museums at the Penn Museum Hospital, which obviously <laughs> is not possible in the middle of a pandemic, um, and preparing to go to Indonesia in July. Um, I had plans to do a photogrammetry project with living orangutans in Indonesia in the wild uh, for three months starting this July. Um, that's obviously also not possible. Um, and that's just kind of postponed indefinitely. You know, I'm not really sure if the spring is going to open up in time, and it's a project that requires me to be out in the rainforest with them where it's not raining, right? Because it's a big piece of fancy photogrammetry equipment that can't get rained on. So um, that might have to be postponed until the next dry season, which would be a year from now. Uh, so that's unfortunate. And then um, in this, the fall, I would have been planning to travel to museums across the U.S. and Europe. Um, to CT scan more orangutan specimens, their collections. And I actually just uh, recently found out I received a leaky grant to fund this. It's very exciting, but then it's frustrating because I'm like, I don't even know <laughs> when I'll be able to go. So that might not be until, you know, I think, I think maybe the spring is a hopeful timeline to, to hope for. Um, so what am I doing instead? Um, I'm analyzing Analyzing data I've already collected. I have already collected some data at the Smithsonian, so I'm analyzing that. I did that last fall. Um, and I'm also writing up what I have already, um, kind of trying to flip that timeline a little bit instead of doing research now and then writing it up after, writing up what I can now. And, um, and one of the things I'm trying to write up is a smaller sample size than I would have liked, but um, it's, some, it's something that I you know, do have significance on and can start writing up, so I'm hoping that that's a good use of my time. And then I'm also preparing to teach my own course in the, uh, in the summer term at University of Pennsylvania as an, as an instructor. So that's definitely a really great thing that I can do right now from home. It's, it's an online class. Um, I do think that my dissertation will probably take longer. Um, and it's, it's hard to say how long, because I just don't know how long it'll take to, to get out to the field and get that data. Yeah. And the, the course that you're going to be teaching this summer, that's not something you would have been doing were, the, were it not for this, right? You would have been exactly. traveling out in the field doing other things. And so um, that represents an opportunity 
activity that's arisen because you couldn't do the other things. Completely. Yeah, I would have been in Indonesia during that time. I would not have been able to teach that class okay. or have consistent enough internet access, even if it were online. So right. it's kind of uh, a, a good thing that's come out of it now. Way. Perhaps a silver lining. Hopefully, yeah. so. Um, so, but but obviously, as someone who does field work, who's where travel is a significant part of what you do, and it's seasonal, and you can only go out in the field at certain times, have these constraints. Um, even when things hopefully get better soon, that may not mean you are able to jump right back into doing what you're doing, because you still have to align it with the appropriate travel season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even if it opens up in the spring. Uh, you know, it'll be raining too hard for me to go out there with this equipment and I'll have to continue to wait until the next dry season. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. So, so a big challenge there. Um, Susanna, you come from a, a laboratory background, right? So your PhD is in microbiology. Um, and, and most of your work, I assume, if not all of your work was done in a laboratory. Um, you, your lab mates were, have not been able to go into the lab to do the work that you would normally be doing. Um, but once you get the green light to do research, you can charge back in and start doing lab work, right? So can you maybe talk about how the pandemic has affected you, your research or lab mates research um, and that different perspective from a, a bench setting versus a field setting? Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me. This is really to be uh, involved in this panel. So like you sort of alluded to at the start, I was in a Kind of interesting there, my private defense was scheduled for the very end of March anyway. And if folks remember whatever happened in March towards not knowing what was happening. So we decided on doing the Zoom defense, I think like seven to 10 days before it was actually scheduled. Uh, and so the other overlapping thing that was happening there is we had to we had submitted my primary first author paper, which was uh, the requirement for graduation was to at least submit and get reviews back. And we got those reviews back at the very end of February. Uh, and, and generally they were pretty easy to address, but there were a couple pieces that they really wanted us to be back in the lab. And we had this kind of difficult decision to make where what they were proposing was going to take a few weeks, if not a few, and we really struggled to decide, are, are we going to try to do these experiments? And we started doing them. And sure enough, a, a few weeks later, UNC decided to put um, some very much needed restrictions on people going into lab spaces. So we then have been, I've been spending my time, I did graduate, I did finish those defenses, uh, and Zoom was kind of interesting. But we've been rewriting and, and answering some of these reviewer comments, and we're going to be resubmitting here pretty soon. And basically our best answer to those concerns of, of we want the, to do these other experiments, we're just saying we can't right now uh, with the understanding that maybe they'll come back and say, that's okay, we understand. Or they might come back and say, well, get this back to us at whatever time that is. And I think as someone who has just recently graduated, I have a really supportive committee. And when I spoke to them as I was looking towards graduation, talking about we're submitting this paper towards the end, have to do a bunch of revisions. What is that going to look like? And, and they very clearly said, you're not allowed to work if you're not getting paid here. Uh, and I think that's sort of unique. Uh, and so I'm at least a little bit protected that I'm not going to be asked to, to work for free after all of this is going on uh, or a year from now because we want to get this, this paper out. So that's kind of what has been going on with with my work uh, as far as it relates to lab and and the lab mates of yours who are who haven't finished and are still sort of plugging away um, has it have they been able to make any progress or were they basically locked out of the lab entirely for the last few months it, yeah it's uh, not many of them have made lab progress uh, very similar situation Alexandra saying about doing a lot of writing I think one of the things about grad school is that you're sort of expected to have about 36 hours in every day where what I mean is that you're supposed to be spending an entire day working in lab and then an entire day uh, doing writing and reading and data analysis and so I think it's sort of been cut down to the pieces of it, there's still a full day's worth of work with that writing, reading, data analysis that a lot of folks are catching up with, but I think it has been really frustrated for them to, when you have these ideas that you read about and you want to test, you just can't do that. You just have to write it down in a, note, in a notebook and think, 
maybe pretty soon I could ask these yeah, questions myself. Right. So I think what we're hearing is that whether you're a field biologist or a lab biologist, it's obviously been a very, very challenging time. So uh, let's ask the tough question now of Melissa, who's the assistant dean in the graduate school. How how's how are graduate schools adjusting to this? How are what are you doing to try to make this bearable um, for graduate students, whether they're field scientists or bench scientists? Yeah, that's a great question, Jory. And uh, I will, if you will, kind of zoom out to thinking about supporting graduate students, you know, writ large, because we do have um, lots of different needs among graduate students. Um, one of the first ways that the graduate school at Duke has been trying to support students is just by uh, consolidating information and then advocating for students. And so thinking about all the different needs that students have, whether they're in field research or whether they're in a lab and bench science, you know, thinking about what kinds of access issues they have and making sure that we're always advocating for what their needs are as students are being made at the university level. And I know our dean has been a huge advocate um, for students and making sure that, that graduate students are thought of. Um, I think even at a place like Duke, where we actually have a majority graduate professional student body, um, sometimes, especially early on, when the decisions were coming quickly, um, a lot of the communications that came from the university were very undergraduate focused. And understandably, because undergraduates were away from campus during spring break and all their belongings were back in the residence halls. So I think there was a lot of focus on what their uh, graduate students have these very particular needs to continue with their research and their work. And it's not about courses um, going online. It's much more complex for them. So try to keep all those needs in mind. Um, another thing that we've been focused on in the graduate school at Duke is, uh, is a remark came to mind, uh, somebody recently said to me in a meeting that quarantine, this is helping the whole world understand what it's like to be a graduate student. So you're isolated from everybody else and it kind of seems like, when is this going to end? <laughs> um, when will we finish? Um, well, we know that graduate school was already really isolating and uh, can pose some challenges to mental health um, even before we came to isolation and quarantine. And so one of the challenges that we've been working on in the graduate school is, is how do we make sure that students get the support that they need in this situation? They're facing different challenges around their access to continuing their research and feeling like they're making progress. How can we provide some support systems to, to, to help them um, find those places to be advocates for themselves with their advisors and their departments and having those conversations and figuring out how they, they find that way to make progress and move forward? Um, so one of the ways that we've been working is to try to find really intentional ways of reaching out to students now that we can't bump into them as we walk across campus. Um, now that we can't lure them to a workshop with the promise of pizza, you know, how do we find students where they are and find what they need and connect them with information and resources to find that, that support they need. Um, and now we're entering a different phase of that process as labs start to slowly open up. And so there'll be a, a new wave of needs and questions that our graduate students need support with. Um, and I'm hearing everything from, you know, students who are super excited about labs opening back up because they really want to continue with the research that brought them to Duke um, and brought them to a PhD program to some nervousness and trepidation about that and um, how to handle that conversation with advisors. So I, I think those are some of the needs that we've heard. Um, since you asked me and since my wheelhouse is professional development, I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, have been working on professional development needs for students. Um, we have been working with our writing studio on campus to extend our graduate writing lab um, for, throughout the summer while classes are in session because we know students who are writing and are kind of disconnected from the structures that they've had in place um, may need some additional accountability and support systems. So we think that's really important. Um, also, my office has been working with the postdoc office on a mentoring and communication series. So we've had some facilitated conversations around coping with COVID-19, dealing with ways that grief can manifest itself during this time, um, a session on parenting and working from home during the pandemic. So, uh, trying to meet students where they are with the diverse set of needs that they have. And then uh, we also have a new workshop series coming online with Duke Learning Innovation um, that's co-sponsored with the Graduate School that's on online skills, anticipating that, you know, come fall, um, there may still be some courses that are online that need some TA skills to facilitate online. 
And then uh, another option that we've tried to create, and this uh, may anticipate a question that you're going to ask a little later, so I'll just hint at it for now. We've, um, with the postdoc office, are co-sponsoring a series of alum Zooms. So 30-minute sessions asking five core career questions of, of PhD and postdoc alums about, you know, about their jobs right now, what are the hiring prospects in their field, and what could graduate students and postdocs do to start building skills to be successful in breaking into those careers. So trying to keep the conversation moving forward, forward looking to fill this time that um, they weren't planning on spending in this way. Great, that's, that's great information. And we did get a lot of questions about um, how, to, how to deal with the job search, especially for those students who are close to finishing up. So we'll, we'll probably come back to that a little bit later in the conversation. But I wanna, I wanna touch on, uh, follow up on something you said. So most of what you focused on was all of the, the wonderful things that you're trying to do directly for and with the graduate students. Has the graduate school been involved in any way in the dialogue with graduate student advisors to, to talk to them about what they can be doing to support the grad students or that they're getting more of that from their deans and their department chairs. I feel like they're getting more of that from their deans and their department chairs rather than coming to the graduate school directly. And I think that's in part because the way that the labs are opening or closing or what their status is has a lot to do with their departments and schools rather than with the graduate school. Um, but I think programs like our University Center of Exemplary Mentoring, for example, where there is, there does tend to be some more interface between um, faculty coming to us for advice. Um, but, you know, the faculty that I've talked to, I've just told them, the things that I see now are um, communication and some structure. But those look different depending on where the students are and what challenges they're dealing with right now. So students need a way to figure out, like, they're making progress even if like Alexandra, you know, they're, they can't go to Indonesia, but maybe they could teach a class. That's an opportunity they wanted to do, um, but they didn't have the chance to. Um, so trying to is really individual. Okay, well, that's great. And, and um, I, I want to now bounce it back to grad students in, on this panel. From your perspective, what, um, and we'll start with you, Alexandra, and then we'll, we'll go to you, Susanna, but what strategies have you been trying to use to keep those lines of communication open with your um, graduate advisor, your committee? How do you, how do you maintain, and, and we got a lot of questions submitted on this topic as well. A lot of people want to know, what can we be doing to, um, you know, to be keeping these lines of communication open? Com yeah. Communication between a graduate student and their advisor can often be uh, a challenge even under the best of circumstances, right? So yeah. right now, what, what are you doing to make sure that you keep communication moving forward? Yeah, I, I definitely want to echo what Melissa was saying about students needing structure um, and communication right now. I think that's really true. I mean, as grad students, we already kind of have to develop our own structure all the time. Uh, now it's 24 seven, you know, we don't even have regular lab meetings to attend and things like that. So I have three committee members that I've been in regular contact with during this. One of them has been doing a virtual lab meeting every week and we all just do a check-in and uh, she's really, really great about fostering vulnerability. And I think that's something that, you know, not all graduate student advisors or dynamic football of, of fostering, but she has done it. And it's a really wonderful space to be able to say like, these are the mental health things that I'm struggling with this week, uh, particularly that relate to the work that I'm doing. It may be motivating myself to get this work done in the midst of this, or I'm really just frustrated that I can't do it. And I don't know how to get through that roadblock. And, and because we're all there together, we're able to then kind of share strategies, things that we're coping with. And just having her be vulnerable about what she's going through too um, really feels like you're not alone in this and it's really affecting everybody. Um, so if, if you can foster that space or have a space like that, I think it's really huge. Another advisor and committee member that I've been in regular contact with, we have a Skype meeting every week and we don't always have an update to go over, right? Sometimes it's just still chugging along on things. But just to have that space so that you, when things do come up, maybe I, I'm going to her often for things that I wouldn't always, just because sometimes there's a lot of little snags that come up and I don't always have friends around me, lab mates around me to talk them through. And having that space with her has been really helpful to talk through any snags and, and issues that I've come up with. Um, 
and I think it's, it's been great for, for both of us to be able to keep that open. And then kind of with all my committee members, we've been going back and forth about contingencies. And this is something to be careful about to not overly do because it's really impossible to predict. But I do have like an Excel document with contingencies for, you know, if it opens up, this is at this time, these are the places that I'll go. And just kind of continuing to have that conversation if something changes, um, I got this funding or this doesn't look like it's gonna open up in time. Um, you know, one of the museums I need to go to is going through a lot of layoffs right now. So we, we had another conversation about what will happen if, um, you know, even when things open up, it's not possible to go visit. So um, that's been really helpful, but again, in moderation. But I think, I think it does depend on the dynamic and some of them you don't, you already aren't regular meet, regularly meeting with them enough. Um, and some people don't want additional structure. So a good thing too is kind of to have a dialogue about what graduate students need right now and to, to either as an advisor, ask your student what they need right now, or as a student say, like, I, I need a regular meeting and structure, or I just kind of need some space to, to get through this and then come, come to you when I'm ready. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Susanna, how about you? You were obviously, as we've talked about, you were, you were in a, a very unique position in graduate school, which is that you were finishing up writing, finishing your writing and preparing to do your defense a time when there's probably a lot of last minute questions that you would have normally with your advisor or your committee. So how did you navigate all that? And, and what did you find were the strategies for successfully maintaining communication with your advisor, with your committee? Yeah, I mean, again, to, to echo what Alexandra's saying of the thing that was most useful to me and that has continued to be really useful is to have a few people to rely on. Um, just like for all of us, I think sometimes we're having a week where we're sitting down at our computers and feeling motivated and feeling supported and other times it's just not the right day for a phone call. It's not the right week to, to be super productive and our advisors are in the exact same boat. Uh, my advisor had actually moved our entire lab up to Massachusetts in December, so I was kind of used to working remotely uh, and because of some difficulties in communication. Of course, she was going through a lot of moving and, and things like that. I started reaching out to my committee members a little bit more and I leaned really heavily on the postdoc that I worked with and, and just to that point of figuring out what you need of being really honest. It's not fun to set up a regular meeting. It doesn't feel great to reach out and ask for it. It doesn't feel great to have to do the introspection of saying, I'm not being as productive as I really want or need to be, or the other way of saying, maybe I'm asking myself too much right now. But regardless to, because I have started reaching out to them already, I had more support going forward so that if, if one person I was talking to said they, they couldn't do it that week, uh, there was some accountability from other folks and there was the ability to, to call someone and say, hey, I'm really frustrated about this situation or I'm really scared about the situation and at least somebody is going to be able to answer and sort of help talk you through that. So let, let's explore that a little bit more deeply. You said, you know, it's not fun to reach out to someone and request a regular meeting. I, I assume that part of what you're saying is you feel like maybe you're imposing on their time during a stressful time. Mm -hmm. For other grad students that might be feeling that way, how, do you, how did you work through that? How did you get past that? Because it, it is such an important thing to have that mentoring structure still in place. I was pretty fortunate uh, around this time last year to talk with a, a life coach for a little while. And one of my biggest, uh, I don't know, one of the biggest hurdles I was facing in grad school was really getting to that graduation point and, and having that, I need a lot of accountability and, and just realizing that was difficult. But once I had gotten to that point, it was still something that that was just a, a mismatch situation and I needed that accountability and I knew I could talk to my committee chair, but I said, you know, he's got his own lab and I, I feel guilty about going. And she said, you know, he said yes to, your, to being on your committee for a reason. He's in a faculty position, he's in an advising position, and also you chose him for a reason, something that you thought that he was gonna be supportive and was gonna help you get through this. And this is something that he has chosen. He is an adult and he can say no, but it's very possible that he will find some fulfillment, that he actually enjoys supporting students and to have someone who he's already said he would support come to him and say, I need support in these ways so that I can graduate. Uh, that was, you know, that was really pivotal to me for starting to make 
that relationship. And I think that it was good that I started it a while ago before all this chaos started happening. And the other, the other point of it's difficult to do this is that, you know, it's sometimes it's sort of like making a dentist appointment for yourself where you know, you know, you need to do it. You know, it's going to be something that's benefiting you in the long run, but it's something that is unpleasant to set up. It's unpleasant to go to. Uh, and it's not necessarily this, this thing that's going to be a, a fun high point of your week. You're basically setting yourself up to have these little moments of stress and just accepting that these weekly or biweekly check-ins are going to help you in the long run, going to help you stay on track, help guide you, help beat back those fears or those realities of, oh, I didn't do anything at all for five days and I don't know what I'm doing now. Uh, setting up those sort of check-ins can be really helpful to take care of the longer running stress in the yeah. end. Although I will say that my dentist is not seeing patients right now. So maybe, you know, that's not the perfect example, at least in my case. But um, but yeah. I'll tell you from my perspective and share this with anyone who's listening, that as someone who's a faculty member, who's an advisor to undergrads and grad students, one of my biggest frustrations right now is that I'm not able to connect with my students as frequently as when they could just pop into my office. And, um, you know, I think I can speak for a lot of other faculty members in saying that we consider this one of the, the most important and valuable and rewarding parts of our jobs. And so we want to be hearing from our students, grad students, undergrads. We want to be supporting you in any way. So if, if that's something that people on this webinar need to hear, um, you know, please don't be hesitant to reach out because that's, that's our job, right? And that's what we love to do. So, um, Melissa, I want to bounce it back to you because we got an interesting question submitted from one of the people um, listening in. And I think you could address this. It um, has to do with specifically um, how this is affecting international graduate students. Um, what are the unique challenges and how are you dealing with those? Could you just take a couple minutes and talk about that? Sure. I, I think international graduate students are having a particularly challenging time at this moment, um, in part because, you know, perhaps normally they might be going home for the summer, um, wherever their home country may be, and they may not be able to get there, and they definitely have concerns that they can't come back um, to the U.S. afterwards, and so they may really be feeling cut off from their support systems at this moment. Um, in addition to all the other kinds of challenges that they're facing as grad students. And I think the other challenge that, um, that they may be having is, is really around what are the career prospects when they do graduate. So uh, international students who have just finished are trying to find those job opportunities um, to use their OPT while they're here um, in order to stay in the US. And you know, right now there's hiring freezes that a lot of them are finding it challenging to try to find those OPT options. Um, similarly, students who are still enrolled um, maybe had an internship lined up for this summer that, that fell through. And so they're looking for something else to try to build skills and experiences. Um, maybe that could count for OPT or um, that wouldn't be charged against their time for OPT if they're looking to use that after they graduate to stay in the US longer. Right, so, so sorry, could you just- definitely have a challenge. Could you just clarify OPT for, if in case anybody's not yeah. familiar with that? Great. Thanks, Joy. I appreciate that. That's optional practical training. And so part uh, for international students, um, they have the option to continue on in the U.S. for a period after they graduate um, under OPT if they find employment or a significant volunteer opportunity that utilizes the skills from their degree. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, and I know there's, I mean, you know, if you look in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, if you look anywhere that's talking about these challenges right now, um, there is a lot of conversation about international students and how all this is affecting the, the really large number of international graduate students we get, um, certainly in the STEM disciplines, but across all disciplines as well. So I think it's a big issue right now. I know a lot of people are trying to wrap their head around this problem and how to deal with it. So um, thanks for addressing that. So Alexander, I want to come back to you. Um, we touched on this earlier, um, but you, you talked about how you're going to be teaching a course this summer, and that's an opportunity that wouldn't, it was something you wouldn't be doing if you were out in the field doing your other work. And yet it sounds like it's gonna be a great opportunity for you professionally. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you were able to get this opportunity to do this and any advice you have for people who are listening in for grad students on ways they might seek out opportunities, whether it be teaching or mentoring or outreach or you know whatever they might 
doing. Yeah, totally. So I, I'm in like a regular writing group with some friends and it really helps us also continue to work through all of this. But in, in our breaks from writing, we were giving each other advice about ways to use this time. And they really recommended to me, they're like, you know, you're, you're in this time and space where you're not able to collect the data that you need for your dissertation. Teaching would be a really great thing to do at that time. So I was, I was like, you guys are right. This is a great idea. And I reached out to um, one of my committee members and advisors, as, as well as a number of people I know at, at nearby universities. Obviously, the nearby universities idea did not work out. They're like totally hiring freezing. It's not. So I don't recommend that route. It's, I mean, maybe it's worth a try. But um, but within my university, it was a really great idea. Letting the department and, and the professors there know that this is something I'm interested in doing and I think would be a really great use of this time. And luckily, um, at Penn, because students this summer are unable to go to a lot of internships and a number of other opportunities that they would ordinarily be doing with their summer, they're, they're taking some requirements online over the summer. So they have an increased demand in the course in the courses in our department. So uh, they needed another person to teach this course and thought of me because I'd expressed this desire. So um, I'm, yeah, I feel really lucky. This is like a really, really great use of this time. And, and it's, it's going to be a really great professional opportunity to me to teach my own course. I'm really I mean, it's like, I'm really excited, but um, I know this is not something that um, is always available to people, that a lot of universities have been reaching out to graduate students to ask for mentors for summer programs that they're doing, graduate student mentors, graduate student advisors, um, and there's increased often, and I don't know about other universities, but at least at Penn, there's an increased demand for TAs and instructors, and Penn has even reached out to graduate students to see who was interested in this. So I think within your university is a really great way to start trying to find, especially because they have hiring freezes too often, but they can kind of maybe hire you. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> maybe Melissa can speak to that better than I can. Um, but other ways to find opportunities are actually online. Like I, I, I think, you know, like I found this panel through a friend, uh, through Jory's Facebook posting, and I was on a podcast uh, from a Twitter friend. And um, I think that reaching out for opportunities online and finding things on Twitter is like not, not a crazy idea. Um, people, people who are far away from you, the only are just as easy to contact as somebody in your city. Like we're all hanging out over Zoom. The only difference is that there might be a time zone issue, but otherwise like reaching out to the people far away who maybe you ordinarily wouldn't are, is now like more available. So that's like kind of uh, also another silver lining in terms of opportunity. You may have just recruited 300 new Facebook friends for me. That's awesome, thank you. Um, great, thanks for, for that feedback. And Susanna, let's bump it over to you because you were already doing a lot of sort of extracurricular types of things while you were in grad school. Um, and I mean that in, in the most uh, reverential of ways. Um, so, you know, you, as I mentioned, you created an organization called PhD Balance, which promotes graduate student mental health. You, I know you were involved in some science outreach through the Moorhead Planetarium at UNC. How did you seek out those opportunities and, and how can people be doing that now when things aren't the way they were a year or two ago? Yeah, so I had been, I'd certainly been doing, I like the term extracurricular activities because I immediately think of like just random sports events. Uh, but Equal. yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was already doing some of that. And uh, once all this switched over, it was kind of frustrating. Actually, my original plan in in February is that I was getting enough uh, inv invitation for talks to make that my full-time job uh, for both science communication and for PhD balance talking about grad school mental health and going to these grad student days um, so I was totally not preparing to go into the SciComs marketing side it was always a competing interest and I very quickly had to rewrite my resume and reformat everything and rethink about what I really wanted to do. And part of that was that I was getting really stressed out about the COVID situation and I was talking to scientists and I figured maybe I would just put that on uh, YouTube or something. But the main point is that we don't know how long this is going to last. We, we know that it's not going to be over in three months. We don't know if universities are gonna be open or what that's gonna look like, but we definitely know we're not gonna go back to the same normal that we had last fall. And it's been really interesting that for this entire, most of my entire time in grad school, people were saying, 
you know, it's great that you're doing these other things, but don't you want to do a postdoc because it's a much more stable position? And as it's turned out, being able to communicate science online and also talking about grad student mental health, that's a pretty sought after set of skills right now. So what I would say is that if there's something that you are interested in, whether it's teaching a class, whether it's getting involved in multimedia production or writing or, you know, whatever that looks like, online tutoring that you've always kind of wanted to do and maybe had a lot of other things that were a higher priority, those are things that can fill in those slots and can not only look good on your resume, but can also help you figure out right now which of those pieces you really enjoy. So I would say, you know, the nice thing about doing what you enjoy is that you get experience specifically in those things and it makes it more likely that you can go on and actually find a job in those topics rather than focusing on what everyone else is necessarily telling you is the the right or the safe choice. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that, I mean, hopefully this hasn't been the case for, our, for either of you, Alexandra or Susanna, but we know that a lot of grad students um, may sometimes encounter opposition from their advisor to spending time exploring these other things under normal circumstances. So it may be that they can be a little opportunistic right now and take advantage of this and seek out some time to do these things in a situation where it's, it's a sort of easier to get away with it, if you will. So, um, well, Melissa, from your perspective, from the grad school's perspective, how are you supporting and encouraging grad students to identify and pursue these, these other op opportunities? Yes, I think we're doing uh, much the same thing, trying to encourage students to reflect um, in just the way Susanna just suggested, you know, reflect about what you want to do, what you could do with this time. Um, I've been part of a university-wide committee looking at um, how to facilitate co-curricular and experiential opportunities for Duke students this summer. And if you're a Duke student on this call, you just saw that website launch last week called keepexploring.duke.edu to try to fill some of those gaps experienced by students who lost the opportunity to do their lab work or field research or, um, or do an internship, for example. So, so trying to find those places. Um, I would also um, just suggest that uh, students do, um, again, a bit of self-reflection and think about what image they're projecting out to the world. I apologize, um, people keep pinging me for some reason, even though I'm on the call. <laughs> a dean's job is never done. <laughs> it's never done. Exactly. I apologize, everybody. Uh, but thinking about, you know, what is the way you present yourself out to the world? Is that your LinkedIn profile? Is that a professional website? Um, is it a podcast? Um, is it a blog, right? And, you know, think about some of those things that you haven't done and think about how you're going to translate those experiences um, that Susanna and Alexander just talked about. Um, or three when you are talking to employers. So how are you gonna present those in a way that makes that narrative compelling? So I think um, doing that thinking right now um, and go ahead and building those skills right now can be a really useful way to spend your time. And um, the last thing I just say is can, don't um, underestimate the value of alumni. So what I've heard from students right now is that they're kind of hesitant to reach out to alumni, kind of around the same kinds of issues that people mention around um, talking to faculty because they don't want to bother them. They feel like they might be burdening them or imposing on them. Um, but my sense is that um, Duke alumni at least really want to be of assistance if they can. And they may not have a job to offer, but they may have advice to offer about what skills you could be using this time to build to break into your desired career path. Or they might have some advice about how to pivot if it looks like that field isn't going to be hiring for, for a while. Um, what else could you do and who else could you talk to? So I would say to everybody who's on the call, you know, think about alumni at your institution and how they could be of help. If they are willing to answer your email um, and willing to help, then go ahead and take them up on that offer. That's great advice from all of you. And it actually allows me to pivot a little bit to something that is um, a response to a lot of questions we got, which is about ways to network right now and the value of networking, right? So you're talking about networking, for example, with alumni from your institution, but, um, what about professional societies, for example? Do, do any of you, and I'll just open this up to any of you, but do you have advice on strategies for, for continuing to build and maintain a network of people, whether it's through alumni networks or through professional societies or through social media? Um, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so the APA conference that I was going to be going to in April was canceled, but luckily um, part, part of the organization or an affiliated organization, Bandit, um, decided to continue on with their happy hour um, that they were going to be doing at the conference. And I saw this on social media and I joined and I had a really amazing conversation with people at all levels of career. I mean, we had people applying to PhD program, all levels of being in a PhD program, um, postdocs, uh, people on all levels of the tenure track speaking about their experience um, kind of with the pandemic and everybody was kind of giving each other really good advice. And I just, and, and that's actually how I got inspired to start making the TikTok videos. <laughs> so was that conversation. So um, I think that there are still some kind of networking opportunities going about, uh, but I, I highly encourage you to get on Twitter to find a lot of them. <laughs> A weird it's a weird weird world that I did not know how much networking is on Twitter but it is <laughs> um, so yeah that's the and then I've done other happy hours from people I've met on Twitter Twitter and it's been great so I've been on a lot of uh, you know networking happy hours from Twitter right Susanna you have like a billion Twitter followers do you have anything to add to that yeah it's actually I mean it's funny now at, at this point because I think I have about 55 thousand um it's it's harder actually to do those those networking things that have a lot of substance uh but i i am a, like i do get to see uh, and it's all about following the people that you appreciate the people that you respect the people who are doing things that you're interested in you know you can follow thousands of people but you're not going to see what you're interested in unless you're a little bit careful with that so i am i do get these kind of notifications that's like oh there's this uh, science communication you know virtual meetup next week and, and maybe that's something I want to pop into. One thing that I have been doing that's really nice is that in you know SciComs business and in, in a, even in academia people are we're not as accustomed to these virtual calls as they are now and and something that Alexandra said earlier is that you're just as close to somebody oh speaking of close to my dogs you're just as close to somebody who is across the country as you are to somebody who's three blocks away the really nice thing about that is that this is a great time to reach out to folks through things like Twitter or through things like LinkedIn or finding people's websites and saying I mean it's it's really cool when I get a message from somebody that says hey ma'am I have a question I don't respond to that but if somebody comes to me and says hi I'm a third year grad student and I'm looking to improve my portfolio in SciComm, would you be able to have a call with me? I'm like, yeah, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll find some time in this schedule. And what I've been doing a lot of, because I'm still figuring out some of my career path, is that I will have a call with, I try to set up calls with people that I think have a cool job or, you know, work at a company that I'm interested in, but not for the purpose of actually getting a job there. Uh, and if you make it really clear that you're just looking for, you know, how, what skills can I build right now? Or how do you like your job? Or what do you wish that you knew at my stage of the career? People are really willing, especially right now, to have that conversation with you. And uh, the biggest question I ask them at the end is, who else should I be talking to? And it's amazing to find out pretty much everyone you ask. And if it's a gone well as a conversation, if they want to kind of help you out or if they're happy to pass you on, they will pass you on to somebody else. So sometimes we think of networking as this find a person, have a conversation, get a job. But the reason it's called network is that you're trying to find different little nodes of this web that you find someone who's exciting and they know the right people. That's really what you're trying to do. And you can build those relationships really well right now online. Yeah. Great advice from all of you. Um, we are starting to run low on time and I definitely want to touch on one last topic because this was this was the one where we got by far the most questions. So I probably shouldn't have saved it till we were running out of time. But, um, but it's about productivity and, um, and sort of balancing now that we're all working at home all the time. How do you stay productive working at home? How do you maintain good mental health working at home? And how do you maintain sort of if at all possible, a balance when, you know, we're here 24 seven, right? It's not, um, there's no separation between work and home anymore. So since you started um, PhD Balance, let's start with you, but I wanna hear from all three of you, your thoughts on this. So I, 
I think the biggest thing is to kind of be flexible with this. Set yourself some guidelines and then understand that every single guideline you set is, is going to change by the day. It's going to change by the week. You're going to figure out something that sounded really good as far as keeping you on schedule or keeping you on track might work for a month and then it falls off. Uh, and so, for instance, I try to do emails every day from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And after that, I don't look at my emails and I'm missing things throughout the day. But the truth is, is that what was happening is I was avoiding my email box for five days because it got so full. Uh, and so kind of chunking it down and instead of saying, how can I be as productive as I want to be? I'm never going to hit that. I am never going to get to the point where I'm as productive as I want to be or as productive as I feel like I should be. And it's more of taking a little bit of time and you know, journaling or just kind of tracking what your day actually is without judgment, looking back and saying, okay, what are some small tweaks that I can make? Or maybe it turned out that I worked 20 hours this week. Could I do 22 next week? Or maybe I worked 20 hours, but really only 10 of those were super productive. And the reason I'm saying 20 hours is that we have this idea in our head that people are actually working 10 hours a day. This is this weird thing that we tell people, grad students that like, oh, the people who are really into it work 10 hours a day. And we know scientifically it's not possible to focus for that long in and day out. And even during the non-pandemic times, grad students feel like they're not as productive. They're not working as hard as they should be. So it's not as though suddenly you're in this position that no other grad students in the past have have felt like it's a totally new unprecedented situation um, but you don't need to feel bad that you're not working eight hours a day because that might not have included going for walks to get coffee with a friend or sitting down or transitioning between the bench and, and home uh, and so what's, what i would say is is just really important is be honest about what's going on and instead of comparing to yourself with, with what you think is what you should do, think about what you're doing and how you can make it just a little bit better. Great, thank you. How about you, Alexander? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree with Susanna. I have been telling my friends all the time how we used to you know, grab lunch together, go get coffee. We used to go to a lot of meetings where maybe we didn't need to be there for the whole time. And, and have a productive day. Um, you know, the commute, all of that was wrapped up into the experience of the day. Um, and so remembering that you actually didn't have eight full hours of work and you were okay with that. And so, so being proud of the few hours of work you get done. If you get two hours of productive work done, like that's, you should be proud of that. Like that was really good. You're in the middle of a global catastrophe, horrible, and it's crazy stressful. It's really awful. And you did two hours of work today. Like that's, that's my friends and I do that to each other all the time. I have a working writing group that we do every day and we meet for two hours. The first 15 minutes we catch up and talk and then we do 45 minutes of writing. We put ourselves on mute. I go for you. We talk about it. What are you going to do for the next 45 minutes? And then we do another 45 minute writing block. We do this every day. And um, I'm proud if that's the only work that I get done that day. It's two good 45 minute blocks and it's really getting me through this. So if you can with your friends, start a writing group on Zoom. I cannot recommend that more highly. I bought this book, writing your journal, journal article in 12 weeks. <laughs> I'm working on it. I think part of it, the first chapter is actually all about how to write productively and it encourages you just to do a little bit every day. People are used to doing writing in these giant, massive, you know, like giant blocks where they just, and it's, they just get totally burnt out. And in, this is book is saying like, actually, if you just do a little bit every day, that's great. And you're going to eventually get it. And that's actually the best way to write. So um, working my way through this book has been really helpful for me to learn those strategies and feel good about even just working a little bit. Um, and then when you're sitting down to work and you just can't, and you feel horrible letting it go, that's another huge piece of advice I have. And then, or, or doing something monotonous, different, cleaning your apartment, like coming, only working when you actually can will make you feel so much better. Because if you're sitting there trying and trying and trying, and it's not happening, it's not happening, you're just going to feel horrible. Um, and then also, I want to encourage everybody to reach out to University Mental Health Support right now. Penn, there's a lot of things that's not doing great, but this is one of the things that really is. It's got like a 24-hour hotline. Therapy is really easy to access right now, and they've made it completely free, like not even any deductible. So um, I highly recommend ch checking out what your university is doing for mental health because it, chances are they've really beefed it up and that's in like 
it's great. Just no shame. Go do that. And then the last thing is try not to contingency plan or read the news too much. I am, I find that that really gets me down on my productivity and I just, I lose a lot when I'm trying to, trying to figure out, well, if this opens at this time and if that's, what are the chances of this opening? Like, no, I'm just, just being here in this moment. I'm writing right now. I'm preparing to teach. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. So we are running really low on time, but I want to give you the last word on this, Melissa. We have about a minute left. Can you just sort of chime in your thoughts and add to whatever, um, add whatever you want to what Susanna and Alexander mentioned? I think they had some really fantastic. Last thing I would just add is, you know, imposter fears are something that we often see graduate students, um, and we might have a tendency to compare ourselves to others. And right now, kind of conveniently, you can't see what everybody else is doing, and that could be, um, but that could also kind of heighten those imposter fears if the, that voice in your head is the only voice that's there and you're not getting those kinds of external feedback from other people. So take advantage, just like Alexander just said, take advantage of campus you know, psychological services, um, take advantage of your, your friends and your colleagues to help give you some other perspectives on what's going well and make sure that you take a chance to celebrate those things um, in, a, in addition to recognizing that you're in a very difficult situation. So celebrate those things that are going yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. And I will add, imposter syndrome is not just for grad students. Faculty experience it. I'm, I'm not gonna put words in your mouth, but I'm sure there are assistant deans that experience it from time to time. We all experience it. So that's, that's an important thing to know. Um, I was gonna say to everybody listening in on this webinar, just take the rest of the day off and heed that great advice. <laughs> However, I'm teaching a class right after this, and I know some of my students are listening in. So everyone else take the rest of the day off. My students, I'm still expecting to see you in class in 30 minutes. Um, but we unfortunately are at the end of our hour, so we need to wrap this up. I want to thank all three of our panelists, Susanna Harris, Alexander Kralik, and Melissa, Bo Melissa Bostrom, for advice, for taking time out of their days to do this, and um, encourage you all to Follow them on Twitter and Instagram and all of those good things. Also, of course, follow Duke Science and Society Initiative so that you can continue to attend these coronavirus conversations. Um, our next one is next Thursday, May 28th. And Tim mentioned that at the beginning of this session, but go to the Science and Society website to get more information on that. It's early two o'clock. They're going to kick me off, but thank you all again. And thanks to everyone else for tuning in. We really appreciate it.